I want to welcome everybody to session 3E at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. My name is Christina Kellum and I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Library Protection Associate at the University of North Texas Digital Libraries, and I am the Vice Chair of the TCDL Planning Committee. I'm pleased to be your session moderator today. So from first for some housekeeping, I want to get started by just making taking a moment to acknowledge the news from Uvalde before we begin the session. I just want you to let you know that myself and everybody at TDL support you every day and especially today. So if anything you're feeling right now and throughout the, the day needs a moment of break, we completely understand and it's completely valid. And I want to encourage you to do what you need to take care of yourself and your loved ones. As also to note, the Texas Digital Library and the TCDL Planning Committee are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. We ask that everyone here today is considerate and respectful in speech and action, attempt collaboration before conflict, uh, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior and speech, and be mindful of your environment and of your fellow participants. You can also view our code of conduct on the tdl.org and I've also included in the chat along with that some resources in terms of helping you Uvalde if you uh, feel the need to do so. The session will run approximately until 2.50 so please feel free to take breaks as needed. The format of the, present, of the session will be our presentations and then followed by a Q&A &A afterwards. So uh, I want to invite you all to say hello in chat, talk with each other, offer resources that you think might be applicable to the session. Um, and of course you can leave Q and A's for me in the chat and I will help moderate them to our presenters. Um, so now on with the show, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Chastity Miles of UNT, um, my fellow coworker. <laughs> I'll hand things over now. Hello everyone, my name is Chastity Miles. I'm the Coordinating Discovery Systems Librarian in the Digital Libraries Division at the University of North Texas. In my role, I'm the Primary System Administrator for Sierra, our ILS, and the UX Researcher for the Library's Digital Interfaces. I will be sharing how we have continued to incorporate the user, how we've continued to incorporate user research after the initial release of the UNT Libraries Catalog to provide a consistent user experience for our students and faculty. Today, I will begin by sharing our initial, our initial reasoning for incorporating UX research into the redesign process, the methods we used, and the design improvements we made, just to give you an idea of where we left off. I will then go over the next steps of how we, through trial and error, began to make UX research a regular practice for the catalog. Finally, I will highlight some of the new interface updates we were able to make as a result. We knew we wanted to incorporate UX research into the catalog redesign because we understood how beneficial it is to receive direct feedback from our users, whether verbally or through observations of their use of the interface. Our goals for the redesign included migrating the catalog over to Blacklight, which provides a more modern user from the interface. We wanted to enhance the navigation to allow users to quickly find what they need in different areas of the catalog. And we also wanted to improve the overall visual design to provide a cleaner, more simplistic, intuitive layout it enables users to effortlessly glance at catalog pages to locate information. Some of our other goals included incorporating facets to allow users to use unique filters to narrow their search results, creating algorithms to increase the relevancy of search results, providing more descriptive item records on both the search results page and after clicking into the, into the records, and enhancing the advanced search page to allow users to narrow their search as needed to produce relevant results. We were able to successfully meet many of our goals and implement the designs in a way that was beneficial for most of our users before launching the catalog. And so our initial user research methods consisted of usability, usability testing to enable us to observe how participants use the catalog to complete various tasks, interviews to acquire feedback about the previous interface, which helped us determine what features users wanted to see transition over to the new interface, as well as needed updates a focus group session that allowed us to get a better idea of how users search the system and use certain features, and design surveys were also used to gather information about user design preferences for the catalog. And the, this is just an example of one of our design surveys for those who may be curious. 
We try to make them short and distribute them only when needed to prevent survey fatigue. We typically ask respondents to select their preferred design for features we would like to add or enhance by providing a set of mockups. Um, we may also try to determine how beneficial certain aspects of the interface are for them through a series of questions so we don't spend a lot of time focusing on something that isn't valuable or that we may need to approach differently based on how they use it. So. Um, the first question um, in the design survey example that I provided um, basically asks users if they search by call number and if so, how frequently. And the second question comes from our usability testing. Um, a lot of our participants during that time stated that the search bar um, should be more visible. So we wanted to create some mockups that either highlight or outline um, the search bar and um, give them the option to pick their preferred design. Um, and option two actually um, is the original version of the search bar. And so we made a lot of progress before releasing the redesign, but the catalog interface wasn't perfect, so we knew we wanted to continue our research. Um, the question then became, how can we continue to improve the user experience of the new catalog? And so I first want to go over why continuous UX research is something we wanted to incorporate. Understanding where our users are getting frustrated while using the catalog is crucial for us because the harder it is for them to use, the less likely they will continue to use it in the future. There are so many platforms providing similar services competing for their attention, and we want to make sure that what we're providing is reliable and easy to search. Um, next, it allows our users to, um, it allows us to make sure that our interface aligns with st industry standards. Um, to ensure that icons, buttons, and other features follow what is used across most websites. So for example, a magnifying glass typically represents search, and so we wouldn't want to change that on our interface because that may confuse our users. Another example of this on um, certain e-commerce sites is the shopping cart, um, and so you wouldn't want to randomly change that on the website because um, then your users wouldn't know where to go to, um, to complete a purchase. Um, and so continuous research um, also enables us to provide a consistent user experience because as industry standards and our users evolve, we wanna make sure that our interface reflects those changes. And so what are our goals? We determined that our goals for future projects are to continue learning about our users. We are constantly experiencing changes within our different user groups. We have groups of faculty and students who leave each semester and new first year students, transfer students and faculty entering. And so we wanna make sure that we continue to provide relevant tools and resources through our interfaces that meet their needs. Um, next, we want to identify user pain points to understand where we can make improvements. We also wanted to observe how users navigate and behave while using the interface through benchmarking. To continue our research, we created a plan for the semester that consisted of design surveys, usability testing, eye tracking, and card sorting to provide us with data related to information architecture, search capabilities, and user flow. And so, this is the reality of what we were able to accomplish during that time. We were able to distribute more design surveys and complete benchmark testing in the fall and spring, which actually took longer than initially planned. Um, the pandemic did play a factor in how much we were able to achieve as much as most of our students and faculty were still working remotely. Um, we were experiencing issues with recruitment and remote testing as well. I was also essentially the only researcher for the catalog during that time with minimal assistance. And so after evaluating our progress um, during these initial rounds of continuous UX testing, we were able to identify some key issues during the first couple of semesters um, that we knew we wanted to address before moving forward. And so um, we experienced many challenges, as I previously mentioned, through the initial rounds of continuous testing that caused us to reevaluate re our approach going forward. Time was a major issue because there are many components of user research to juggle at any given time, and we don't have anyone with a position solely dedicated to UX that can provide an extensive amount of time to these projects. And so the pandemic um, also made many aspects of our research tricky because we had to figure out a new way to do traditional UX work. We also had to figure out a remote testing setup that worked well for both moderators and participants and determine how we could provide um, participants incentives in exchange for their time. Recruitment became increasingly difficult as well because we had limited options to reach students remotely. Also, a considerable amount of effort goes into each project from planning and recruitment to providing recommendations to stakeholders. 
We also experienced other challenges. Software for user testing and analysis, and analysis can be costly. So throughout the pandemic, we've had to find makeshift solutions to help us get the information we needed in the most cost-effective way. Once testing was complete, we focused on preparing reports for stakeholders. This is an aspect of research that can fall under time and effort as well, because we realized that reviewing numerous recordings and transcriptions and putting the research together for reports can be just as much to manage as the actual testing. We didn't have a large budget during the pandemic, which prevented us from being able to upgrade our analysis software, and it required us to spend more time doing a lot of things manually. Um, another challenge was getting support and buy-in from stakeholders, which was actually unexpected because you don't realize how much easier it is to advocate for users when you're working on a project before launching rather than when you're doing continuous research. You know, typically before the first release, everyone is focused on the new interface. We all want to know what our users think and we're prepared to make needed changes. However, once the interface is launched and everyone begins to shift their focus to other projects, it then comes down to you. Are these changes really needed? Is this what the user really wants? And it starts to go beyond simply just advocating for users to really considering how much effort is this going to take for developers? And do I have enough research to support these recommendations? And so this past academic year, we've considered previous challenges and re-strategized to make our continuous research more efficient. To start, I now have the assistance of two additional staff members when needed. And we've also updated our recruitment methods, which now includes guerrilla testing, which is basically where we, where it's where we go out on campus and approach students, um, or we just set up a table and start testing in an open space. Um, for recruitment, we have found that this method is less time consuming and we get a better response from students. We also provide hybrid testing by allowing students and faculty to determine if they want to participate in certain forms of testing, either remotely or in person. Um, even though we are all back on campus for the most part, I still wanted to remain flexible and make it easier for our distance learners to give their feedback. We are also now taking on smaller scale projects that are less time consuming, but still provide valuable data. So we've gathered a lot of valuable information and feedback through continuous UX research, leading to new discoveries that enabled us to make needed updates to the catalog interface. We've updated the facet um, to include a date widget to make it easier for users to search by publication date. Most of our users decided that adding both the scale and allowing numerical form entry would be the best use of this feature for them. Um, and the screenshot to the left is a date widget based on feedback from 57% of our users. We also updated item records to include more descriptive information by adding a table of contents after allowing students and faculty to choose the layout of their preference. And the new table of contents um, was added under the more detailed section of our item records based on the feedback of 76% of our participants. After observing our participants struggle to find where they should go to place an inter interlibrary loan, and hearing their feedback during usability testing, we did determine that the language used um, to link to ILLiad, um, which as you can see is request through ILLiad, um, it was a problem because many of them are not familiar with the term. Um, and we've also discovered that a lot of them aren't really familiar with the interlibrary loan process in general. And so to ensure that clear language is used throughout the catalog, we recommended that the link be changed to request through interlibrary loan based on user preference. We also wanted to determine if our users knew about our sort by relevance drop down menu. So we used heat mapping to see where users would click to access this feature. While most respondents did click in the right area, there were enough incorrect clicks on advanced search and the general search button to lead to the recommendation of making sort by relevance more visible on the search results page. And this could be done either by enabling the menu to expand automatically when users land on the page um, or enhancing the text in some way. We also continued to um, update the advanced search by adding facets that would be useful for helping users narrow their results and incorporating the sort by relevance menu. Um, users expressed um, during our focus group sessions um, and interviews that the previous catalogs advanced search didn't always provide relevant results or allow them to specify their search according to their preference. So we really wanted to focus on improving this feature um, and we did make some updates that allowed us to do this in sort of an untraditional way. I know for um, 
typically for search results, um, advanced search pages, you don't um, typically see the option to search using facets. And so that was something cool um, that we wanted to add to allow them to retrieve re the relevant results that they're looking for. We also added a few tool tips throughout the catalog, um, mainly focusing on information related to item records. And that's the information that you can see um, both on the search results page and after clicking into the item record. And we really wanted to provide, um, to add the tool tips to provide clarity for um, users um, for certain things that could be useful to them, such as the availability of items and um, requesting items for pickup. And so to summarize, we were able to use continuous UX research to enhance our discovery system's user experience through significant trial and error. The main takeaways were to be flexible when creating strategies and roadmaps. Um, UX kit research can really take unexpected um, turns once you begin to observe users and hear their feedback about an interface. Also, we wanted to, um, when we began to experience challenges, we really had to um, realize that it's okay to stop and reassess our goals and our methods of requiring needed data during or after our projects. Um, and finally, it's essential to focus on making incremental changes. Um, everything doesn't really need to be updated at once. We've learned that our continuous UX research is often more about making um, the data and recommendations available for our developers um, so that they can make data-driven decisions when needed rather than um, seeking immediate improvements. And that concludes um, the presentation. Um, thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Chastity. All right, it's now Samantha and Ada of, South, of SMU. <laughs> My apologies. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Samantha Dodd, and I am uh, an archivist here at Southern Methodist University. I am also currently the chair of the steering committee for TARO, and I'm joined today with my colleague, Ada, who chairs the website and technology subcommittee of TARO. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, TARO is a regional archivist consortia website made up of over 70 repositories, including libraries, museums, cultural institutions in the state of Texas. It's a free open source website that hosts all of the finding aids and provides a point of um, where researchers can search across all of these institutions at once. Uh, it was the first initial website began in the 1990s and realizing that we needed to keep up with modern users needs and update the website. We went through a 2015 NEH planning grant to redesign the website and then an implementation grant we received in 2018. So we began a project to overhaul everything about the website, the workflows in the spring of 2020, which I got to tell you was a great time to start a massive uh, redesign project that was going to affect 70 repositories in your area. Um, but uh, we, despite all of the challenges of the pandemic and a, and a statewide snowstorm in 2021, we did launch the website uh, last fall that we redesigned. Uh, this website is actually, or this presentation today is a follow-up to one we did last year at TCDL. So we're going to talk about the final steps of the beta site, the UX testing that we went through, and how we incorporated that feedback and what the future of Taro looks like. Um, this is a glimpse of what the original Tarot website was, so you can see it was very dated. Uh, last year we talked about the massive amount of data remediation all of the repositories had to undergo so that we could migrate all of the finding aids from this legacy website onto the new one with all the features that we wanted to add. Um, so next slide please. Here you can see basically the grant timeline. Um, so in the spring of 2021, we were trying to get through all of the data remediation. We hit the snowstorm. People still hadn't quite reopened from the pandemic. So we started to lag behind in how much, how many files we had remediated, which could then be used on the testing website. 
but we did manage to get some ready for the beta launch of the site in May of 2021. Uh, next slide. So here you can see in May, we launched the administrative side. Previously on the old website, repositories had to use an FTP server to upload files. They had to wait for our institutional host down at UT to run the server update, so there wasn't instant availability. This new admin launch was going to allow repositories to be able to log on, instantly update, add, and change their files. Next slide. And then in July, we launched the beta of the new website, which was going to have all kinds of new search features, browse features, maps, um, links that we were going to be able to offer users and researchers. Um, and so this is what we started to test in the summer of 2021. And so now I will turn it over to Ada, who's going to go over our UX testing that we did. Hello, everyone. My name is Ada Negraru, and I am the chair of the website and technology, or for sure, WebTech uh, subcommittee, uh, which is one of the uh, Tero stakeholders groups that provided input on site design and functionality. In the spring of 2020, our uh, group started putting together an Excel spreadsheet with um, all the what we call the stakeholders wish list. Um, so we created separate tabs for each page that uh, we wanted a new site to have as well, uh, and all the required and optional elements that needed to appear on uh, each individual page. But before that, in the fall of 2019, we uh, were also tasked with uh, conducting usability um, testing on uh, the new uh, Tarot 2 website after uh, it was going to launch. And uh, for that purpose, uh, we developed a number of user personae uh, based on the different uh, user groups that we thought would be the target audience of the website. Um, and based on a research experience that we thought the target audience would have. Um, at the time, uh, we were counting uh, that uh, the um, testing setting was going to be in person and uh, uh, phrases such as uh, social distancing and uh, remote working were not part of our vocabulary, uh, which uh, meant that we thought we'd be able to administer a Google form um, type of test uh, at, uh, in a physical um, space uh, such as a reference desk or a reading room. So we populated that Google form with a variety of testing scenarios that uh, volunteers would be able to choose from in a drop down menu, either file uploading, usage statistics, simple or advanced searching, um, and uh, would go from there. Well, in the fall of 2020, it became apparent uh, that much of our original planning had to be readjusted due not only to the pandemic and moving the testing in a 100% online environment, but also due to the revised timeline of the website's launching. So when the soft launching of the uh, administrative interface was announced in May 2021, uh, WebTech was also charged with collecting and recording stakeholders' feedback and reporting it to the Taro 2.0 product owner at biweekly intervals. Uh, the biweekly reporting schedule would continue through August 16 with uh, the launching of the beta public interface plan for July 13. This meant that uh, we'll have about three months to provide uh, feedback on the back end of the website, but only uh, a few weeks, four or five, to interact with the public interface uh, during the summer at a time when the end of the school year and staff vacations meant that less time could be devoted uh, with interacting with both the back end and the front end of the site. So we immediately started developing a list of uh, tasks for our group members to go through when accessing the administrative sites, uh, anything from creating accounts, uh, issues with login, QR code readers, uh, two-factor authentication, file uploads, documentation, and button labeling. So, and um, 
we uh, noted whether anything, any terminology were, was confusing. For example, uh, what uh, the site labeled as change of finding aid uh, was actually supposed to be replace of finding aid. And we made uh, recommendations. Uh, we originally uh, started uh, with Trello a board, with a Trello board um, system, but um, we realized that actually a simple Google uh, shared file would be better suited for our purposes because it allowed us to uh, record examples. Um, Write, write, uh, write down uh, longer explanations of what's not working, uh, share screen captures, uh, and so on. Um, by the time the front end interface uh, launched on, in July of 2021, our uh, group was already in a routine of uh, recording the feedback and communicating it to the product owner every other Friday. And by the end of June, uh, the list of new issues was considerably shorter, but that quickly changed in uh, July when the public interface was launched and a com completely new set of issues uh, started appearing uh, and uh, things did not work as expected with uh, searching in finding aid navigation. Uh, there was a confusing display of content, um, content lists, uh, mobile functionality was lacking and so on. Uh, so in addition to the delay and function functionality problems, we were also aware that compliance issues prevented a large number of finding aids from being migrated from the legacy website to the new website before the August 16 feedback deadline which meant that we had uh, a smaller pool of finding gates to base our uh, usability testing on. The legacy site content was scheduled to be migrated at the end of August uh, at the time, and only those finding gates that had been remediated to conform to Taro 2.0 standards would make it to the new website. At that time, uh, we decided to postpone formal end user experience testing until after the uh, public uh, launching of the Taro 2.0 website, which happened uh, in late September. Other factors that we needed to address before uh, conducting uh, community usability testing were uh, a smaller pool of volunteer testers in summer versus fall, designing a test that needed to be administered entirely online, uh, which meant that we had to rewrite the prompts and instructions, redesigning uh, the task prompts to only reflect the content available on the website immediately after the migration of the compliant finding aids from the legacy site to the new site, planning for the dissemination of the usability test without relying on in-person interactions with students, faculty, and other researchers. We also expected that an incomplete product would invite negative feedback from the end users. Um, so in order to prevent, uh, to also prevent survey fatigue, uh, we decided to actually give our uh, respondents uh, the choice to either um, go through a very short survey that only had two questions, or if they so chose uh, to go through a task-based questionnaire should they want to. Um, so um, at that point, uh, we decided to include the same uh, top section in both surveys, um, the long one and the short one, uh, that uh, had our uh, respondents indicate what user group they belong to, where, uh, from archivists, librarians, their point of contact, all the way down to the um, K through 12 population, um, and also in we included uh, other types of uh, researchers. Um, uh, as far as how we would uh, ad address uh, how we'd reach out to our uh, volunteer testers, uh, we included uh, a blog in the Tarot Today, um, a blog post in the Tarot Today blog space. Uh, we uh, use the email listservs, uh, the um, 
that address the Taro member community. And we also invited uh, repositories to include uh, the invitation to test the site in their newsletters, websites, and uh, other uh, communication channels. What did the survey ask? Well, uh, the short survey was very simple. Uh, it asked two questions. What does Taro 2.0 do well? Or what don't you like? The free and it would include a free response space. The longer questionnaire was task based and um, it gave the responder uh, the option to either upload a, a finding aid if they uh, were capable to do so or to conduct a searching. Uh, and we asked whether they were able to complete the task, yes or no. And uh, we also included the same two um, questions from the short survey with space for free responses. Uh, the searching task included three prompts, find materials about the Texas suffragette, Texas musicians from the Depression era, historical uh, photographs of African Americans in Houston in the, uh, the 1950s through 1960s. So what were the answers? Uh, the short survey was uh, filled out by 43 uh, respondents, while 24 uh, individuals um, chose to respond to the longer questionnaire. Uh, for both, uh, the large majority, about 70% of responses came from the archival uh, library community. So in general, uh, our respondents liked uh, the updated logo and site design, uh, the instant file upload experience, which was a huge difference when compared to the previous FTP uh, server upload, uh, when um, one would have to wait about a week or so to see a finding aid published to the front end. Um, the advanced searching was finally available by the time we opened the survey period in November. And um, our uh, respondents also liked the ease of navigation between site pages and the repository spotlight section, which was a uh, which offered um, features on a repository at a time on, on the landing page uh, based uh, on a rotation basis. Uh, however, respondents had plenty to say about the things that they did not like. Um, and first of all, developers kept working on the website and releasing significant updates while the survey period was open, which meant that someone interacting with the website at the beginning of the survey period would not have the same user experience as someone responding to either the short survey or the questionnaire a few weeks later, closer to the end of the survey period. In general, respondents did not like the searching experience as expected results were not retrieved, Boolean uh, operators and adding uh, quotation marks around search terms did not improve precision. The finding a display was clunky and confusing. Container guides um, and sections that include lists of paragraphs were awkwardly formatted. A navigation among finding aid sections did not work all the time and mobile func functionality was lacking. Some responses to the question of what you don't like about the site were laconic, such as nothing at all. Others included uh, in, uh, included even expletives, I can't find a blip thing. A few responses were outside of the survey scope, like someone who complained uh, that they were denied in-person entrance to a repository um, because of pandemic restrictions. Of course, uh, that was something that um, the uh, Tarot 2.0 website had nothing to do with. Um, in general, though, um, our uh, the responses that we received reflected a high degree of interest and investment in the Taro 2.0 website as a tool available to the uh, Taro stakeholders and the larger research community. Uh, at the end of the testing period, the responses uh, were uh, collected. Um, and uh, an Excel spreadsheet was generated uh, that informed the steering committee um, on 
uh, what the responses were. And this was combined with uh, the uh, usability um, feedback document that by the end of uh, 2021 grew to be about 105 page long. Um, and uh, the two types of um, usability testing and feedback recording um, generated um, a list of outstanding issues that informed the steering committee, the product owner, and the developers on the items that they still needed to address uh, in order to have an improved website. And I am going to turn it over to Samantha to address uh, the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Ada. So once we had launched the website in October of last year, beginning in November, December, the developers gave us about three or four more what they called pushes, where they would launch into another cycle of addressing the outstanding issues and the feedback that they were receiving. During this time, we were also still collecting usability, testing, and feedback, which again was challenging because I could see something wrong with the website in my office, but by the time I walked next door to Ada's office, the site had changed already again and they had addressed an issue or something else would get fixed and then something else would break. So it was a constant, we were just documenting and triple documenting and encouraged every stakeholder and user to, even if you think we know it, please send us your feedback so that we can, we can keep generating this list. As part of the NEH grant, these are the remaining outstanding tasks we were needed to accomplish by the end of um, April 2022, which included a strategic plan for what we do next um, and lead a repository uh, wide controlled access update. But it was in November that we realized that due to all of the unforeseen pandemic related issues and snowstorms that we weren't gonna get nearly as far as we had wanted to in redesigning this website. So we sought other solutions and next slide. Uh, sought additional funding. And so we applied for an Americans Rescue Plan Act grant, which we did receive in January of 2022. And what this is doing is giving us nine additional months of development of the website. So the steering committee uh, took the reports and documents from Ada and WebTech and compiled a new most viable products guide, which was basically a list of all the still remaining outstanding issues. We ranked our priorities of what we still really need the site to do and gave that to the development team who is continuing to work on this website until September of September 30th of this year. Um, so we've already seen tremendous improvement since the beginning of this year, and so we have a little bit more to go, and so hopefully the site that we wrap up in September will be everything that we had hoped and set out to do. So I hope that next year you will join us at TCDL for Tarot Part 3, where we can address the, the wrap up and issues and things that hopefully we have overcome by the end of this year. Next slide. Um, here are the basic contexts. So the new website, originally we were housed, um, our host institution is the University of Texas at Austin, but as part of this redesign, included a new web address. So now txarchives.org is the home for Tarot, where uh, researchers can go and access all of these tremendous resources. Tarot Today is the home of the blog and listserv for member repositories, but that is also going through a redesign this year so that it will become the resource uh, hub for all members, which will include guides to how to use the website, how to create accounts, how to use the subject terms and browse terms and all the new features of the site and how to optimize their best practices so that their resources can be found on the website. Uh, the Terra Wiki page is basically the administrative home for all of the steering and committee minutes and governing documents for the Terra uh, committees that run uh, the repository. So I believe that is it for us. Thank you so much guys for joining us. I think I'll turn it over to Christina. All righty, thank you so much. Uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute or ask in the chat and I'll make sure to send it to the correct presenter.
and I welcomed the silence. It was a lot of information. Y'all did, y'all, all three of y'all did some really amazing work under some really fast deadlines or by yourself. <laughs> Let's see, Clayton asks a question for Chastity. Are there any UX recruitment methods or incentives that you found successful? Um, I would say our most effective recruitment method is just to do um, guerrilla testing where we'll go out and um, either approach students or um, just set out a table in the open and do usability testing that way or interviews. Um, we found that we've can, we've been able to like condense um, a lot of our information into a shorter amount of time. Um, so like typically usability testing, it can be from 30 minutes to an hour. But when we do guerrilla testing, we make that we decrease that time to about 10 to 15 minutes by only doing about maybe like five tests um, for the users to go through and complete um, compared to the compared to the traditional amount. Um, and so that makes it um, more convenient for user or for participants um, and people that are um, trying to decide whether they want to participate or not. Um, we've also found that um, food is a major incentive for people to want to participate. So we always have snacks um, and um, we usually give out different things like tumblers, like coffee tumblers and um, notebooks, things like that. Um, and so like when we set up the guerrilla testing, we'll have those things out on the table. And so people will naturally just stop by and inquire and want to know what's going on. And they're more likely to participate that way. Um, so we found that that recruitment method has been um, the most successful for us. Um, and um, other than that, we usually recruit by email um, and that is effective as well. Um, but we just find that the guerrilla testing works better for us. Edward is asking about uh, resources to do usability uh, testing. Any of y'all have any offers or suggestions? I would say um, for me, when I um, started, um, Nilsen Norman Group was a really good resource um, for me. Um, I attended one of the conferences and then um, they also have a website. And they give, they give a lot of um, great information about how to conduct usability testing, um, whether remotely or in a traditional setting. Um, that's been one of the most helpful resources for me um, so far. Our uh, group started with, um, first of all, doing research on uh, user persona and uh, what uh, the different um, expected behaviors would be. Uh, and um, frankly, uh, it's been a while since we actually uh, put together uh, that list of expected behaviors, but uh, there are re uh, resources uh, available in um, acad academic uh, search databases like EBSCO um, and so on. But we did uh, start from what we expected researchers uh, to be um, to be able to uh, get out of testing. Uh, and we also um, started with a very simple list of um, what the, our site uh, was able to provide uh, at the time um, before uh, it was uh, going to be uh, completely overhauled. Uh, so we thought from the point of view of um, a researcher, a user, what would want uh, a site to be able to give us. And uh, we did a list of um, uh, different types of um, 
search behaviors, uh, information that we wanted to, to see on the site. So it, it was uh, very informal at first. And then from there, we also conducted um, EBSCO searches and trying to find any kind of information uh, or um, even Google searches on what our literature is out there on um, usability testing itself. So uh, don't discount that. Not necessarily um, a specific resource, but just something that we noticed um, in our own experiences to consider is making sure you're if you're drastically changing a website or features to document what your existing site had looked for. And that's where our Google document with the screen captures came in really handy because as we said, we were testing the website as it was changing almost instantaneously and daily. And we're like, wait, what did that page look like originally? I liked what we had before, but then it was gone. Um, but then we could always like send the developers, here's the screenshot of what we had like a week ago. Like what was the error or can we go back to this look that we had? Um, and again, it's just been really helpful to have that ongoing list all the way through the project. So like she said, it's hundreds of pages now, but we can go through everything that we saw at one point in time, um, which has been helpful now as we're going through this new grant funded development period where we sent the developers like, here's what the original site had in terms of this display of the container list, which was one of our most common uh, feedbacks that we got is that they don't like the new container display. So we were able to show them like, here's the original site, here's it, what it looked like for a brief period for like a week or two in July that we liked, but then it went away when something else changed in the site. So we can at least give them examples like this is what we need it to look like. So again, just document, document, document um, the project, especially if it's an ongoing, constantly changing on a daily basis. Because uh, if it's gone, it's gone. And having that has been really helpful in communicating with the developers. I think we have room for one more question if we have anything lingering around. All right, to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, I just want to go ahead and wrap up the session. I want to thank everybody for joining today. We do have one more session today, and then we have uh, some more meetings that are tomorrow that are more interest group focused. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>